so let's just say that. Okay, let's start. Okay, welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. We're back in touch with our good friend uh, uh, up in Wisconsin now, and he's going to fill us in on his activity <coughs> on a half an hour, a little uh, abbreviated program, but he's on a hard break at, at the hour to reach out to the whole wide world with all kinds of uh, <coughs> support for the establishment that he's a, a singular person aware, uh, uh, famous for. He's in complete and total ass assumption of agreement with everything the establishment says. <laughs> he's the voice of the establishment with authority, and that's uh, Mr. Fetzer up in Washington now. Good, in Wisconsin, good to talk to you again. Uh, sorry we got a little abbreviated this, but it's good to see you again. Thank you, Harold. It's a great pleasure. You have quite a distinction for creating, really, cable television in New York. So I'm a huge fan of you, my friend. Well, I'm a fan of you, my friend. This is a mutual admiration society that we're members of and everything. And I think we both got a take on wanting to understand things a little bit more uh, in depth than what the authorities might want all of us to think. What do you think? You think there's some things that ought to be made available to people that the authorities would rather they do be available, be aware of, and that's a problem? Well, Harold, since uh, my retirement after 35 years of uh, uh, being a university professor offering, co offering courses principally in logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning, <laughs> yeah. I retired in 2006 from the Duluth campus of the University of Minnesota, where I was distinguished McKnight University professor, I have been doing my best to expose the shenanigans of the government, whether it's with regard to JFK, 9-11, Sandy Hook, the Boston bombing, Charlottesville, Parkland, even the moon landing, Harold. <laughs> okay, yeah, there's a little, you got a kind of broad tablet you can work on there. There's kind of a lot going on. Anyway, that's good. We were just discussing things in terms of communication, and uh, I, I, I want to digress just uh, personally for a moment. Uh, the fellow I grew up with in Detroit as a young lad was named Robert McKnight, so I'm curious, McKnight, who that is, and um, also there was something else in your, 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 your thing uh, 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 in, in, in Minnesota. That's it. My daughter is a professor of theater at the University of Minnesota, uh, Minnesota in Minneapolis. Yes, Are you terrific. Are familiar terrific. with Minneapolis? And is it a happening town for the Midwest, or what is it? Well, I think it is, though. It turns out there's a lot of electronic surveillance going on in Minneapolis. They seem to use it for pilot studies, Harold, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> But the theater department in the Twin Cities has a very good reputation. Yeah, she just got she just got nominated as the best teacher there at the whole university. I'm kind of proud of her, you know. Oh, that's fabulous! That's she, fabulous. She, yeah, I'm proud of her. She's in theater, theater, you know, and she likes uh, Stanislavski and all that kind of stuff. And McKnight, what is the McKnight? He was my friend, as I said. The friend I grew up with was Robert McKnight, a young fellow. But uh, what is, who, or did, who was McKnight? Well, there was a, a foundation that wanted to support a new rank for uh, 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 full professors who have made particularly distinguished contributions to enhance the reputation of the University of Minnesota. Oh, I see. And okay. yeah. it, it was introduced in 1996, and yeah. I was among the first 10 to be appointed to that rank. Yeah, well, that's a, that, that's a distinct honor and so forth. Now, I wonder if we could. We got this tonight. Uh, President uh, Trump uh, is going to give them a, 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 a statement to the nation about his idea of a wall and so forth down there. Everybody's got an item du jour uh, around that issue and so forth. And so that's important. And now they're coming up and saying they should not be, he should not be able to do that unless, uh, you know, Schumer and Pelosi get a chance to have their say. That's part of the establishment. What do you think about the establishment figures being able to have the right to communicate somewhat to the, ple the to the to the plebeians or to the lesser to the people? And well, that, where, that, where does it all stand? Communication, establishment, and the need for something other than just what the establishment wants the folks down in the field to understand. 
Well, the, the, the CIA began infiltrating the mainstream media back in the 1950s, Harold. It was so successful that by 1975, William Colby, yeah. then its director, was able to testify to Congress that the agency owned everyone of any significance in the media. Uh -huh. That was closely followed by Carl Bernstein's article, yeah. The CIA and the Media, in Rolling Stone in 1977. Uh -huh. We explained that high officials had boasted their greatest successes had been with Time, Life, The New York Times, and CBS. Uh -huh. and, it, and in that era, if you controlled Time, Life, The New York Times, and CBS, you had a lock on the American news. It's got worse yeah. uh -huh. today, but Harold, because of the internet, yeah. they're having to cope. And that, that's why they're suppressing my research so much. I have just today published a blog yeah. about a lawsuit that's been brought against me by one of the fake parents from Sandy Hook. Ah. He's a he's a fellow by the name of Leonard Posner. He has it's been reported to me twenty three different websites he used to attack those who are doing research on Sandy Hook. Uh -huh. uh, there are many who have wondered why he hadn't come after me. Uh -huh. Well, now he has. Uh -huh. They have they have hired a very formidable uh, law firm from Minneapolis. Uh -huh. Mess. Besher and Spence uh -huh. Limited has it, it, it's a very powerful law term to sue me for defamation oh. on the grounds that my my assertions that a death certificate that Lenny gave to a research colleague of mine by the name of Kelly Watt uh -huh. is a fabrication uh -huh. that it's a fake and that no children died including the, the son he purports to have, Noah Posner. So I just published about this lawsuit. It's highly unusual. Uh -huh. Someone wants, wants this to stay in court, but I had the opportunity of filing a motion to dismiss uh -huh. or an answer, yeah. and I chose filing an answer because I want this to go forward to a formal legal resolution. Ah, wow. Yeah, fake news. That's another thing we hear quite a bit now. Fake news, Mr. Trump uses it often, or the the established state and that kind of thing. And he's uh, he's bringing into uh, question in the minds of many a an attack upon the fake news or the fake uh, situation that we all live in and accept in general terms. What do you think? Well, he's he's really doing a very great system? service on behalf of the American people, even if the Democrats don't like it. Yeah. There's been an awful lot of collusion between the mainstream and the Democrats. The whole Russian business was an elaborate hoax, Harold. Yeah. I'm sure you heard the news that Christopher Steele, who authored that so-called dossier mm. where Trump is supposed to have hired a couple of prostitutes to urinate on a bed that Barack Obama had purportedly slept in was a total fabrication. He uh, testified to a judge under oath yeah. in the UK recently that he'd been hired by Hillary Clinton to compose the dossier, which just stunned the judge. Yeah, right. Well, now, what about that? How, how are we to handle this? Now, we've got a revolution in... Uh Communications. I can you are you not you haven't got enough years to remember when there was no television at all, do you? Can you remember that? I remember we had our first TV. As I recall, it was 1952. I was living in La Habra Heights near Whittier, California. Yeah. It was kind of a big wooden thing. Uh, I remember the test pattern with the Indian very right. clearly. Indian Carol. Right, 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 right. Well, I can remember when there was no television at all. I mean, it didn't exist. I'm older, right? I guess by a little bit, little red dot in the corner, you're listening to Mummer's Cave and some of the radio programs. We only had radio. So now we've got a surfeit of uh, communication capability, don't you think? And uh, what what is your take in general in terms of uh, the implications of the communications revolution that seem to be coming exponential almost with change? that has seems to be developing every day that you turn on your mind? Well, in 2012, which is the year they brought us Sandy Hook on the 14th of December, Barack Obama moved to nullify the Smith-Mutt Act yeah. of 1948, which forbade the use of the same techniques of disinformation and propaganda within the United States that the agency was using without. Uh -huh. And it began a whole series of 
completely staged political theater events, including Sandy Hook, including the Boston bombing, including Orlando, including uh, Charlottesville, uh, Parkland, even Las Vegas, Harold. I, I ha uh, because my first book on Sandy Hook, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, which appeared in 2015 with 13 contributors, yeah. including six current or retired PhD professors, yeah. exposed that the school had been closed by 2008, that there were no students there, that it was a FEMA drill presented as mass murder. Uh -huh. Amazon banned the book after having been on sale for less than a month, but sold nearly 500 copies. So... As a consequence, I had to found a book company of my own to get these out and make them available to the American people at moonrockabooks.com. Well, well, God bless you. God bless you indeed and everything like that. And that. Who, are, who are some of the colleagues that you relate to in your stance concerning fake news or concerning news or concerning, let's just use a term that's an interesting one, the actual truth of things? which is sort of a big issue in that. How many people are you able to associate with in that coterie of people who are really paying attention to that question of what is the news, how is it done, what is the uh, implications of what's happening in terms of how the news can get to people or the, the, the communications revolution that we're going through? Well, all my, all my research is collaborative. Just yes. as I had 13 contributors to the Sandy Hook book, yeah. I have a dozen to 15 on the other books we publish. We now have a dozen, Harold, uh -huh. on 9-11, on the moon landings, on uh, uh, Charlottesville, on Parkland. That's our most recent publication. We have books on Las Vegas and the Kavanaugh kerfuffle coming up, by yeah. the way. Those will be out in early this year, early this year. Yeah. Now, if you put all my collaborators together, there are uh, around 100, but I'd say depending on which specific area, there's a smaller number of most important contributors. For example, in relation to JFK, yeah. uh, David W. Mantic, who has both a PhD and an MD, yeah. is the world's leading expert on the medical evidence. Uh -huh. He and I collaborated on three books, which were my earliest work in the area of, re of conspiracy research, which I actually published while I was still on the faculty of the University of Minnesota, You're Assassination talking. Science in 1998, Murder in Dealey Plaza, 2000, and the Great yeah. Zapruder yeah. Film Hoax, uh, 2003, yeah. where the University Herald, get this, even sponsored my conducting two conferences on JFK yeah. as a faculty member, one in Minneapolis in 1999, yeah. and the other on the Duluth campus in 2003, which became the bases for two of those books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so that, 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 that's Dallas and all of that sort of thing. I guess what I was reaching for is um, are we, with all the expansion of that, first of all, we begin to get out of uh, focusing upon one focus when we had radio. There, we, it goes back to before. I sang a little song to you off campus. I'm not going to take up our time now to rent my rendition of Harry Lauder. Which you're it was love. It was lovely, yeah, Harold. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I know, but that's just between you and I. I don't think I want <laughs> it in public because that's going back to the hit parade of the 19th century. So one wonders with uh, history and so forth that it's coming into a time where um, uh, uh, the fake news issue is a major one, right? And you've been running that sucker down, as it were, and so forth. And is it on both sides of the political equation? Is it oh, no, it's much, sides? much more on the Democrat side. There's very little fakery on the Republican, virtually non-existent. Barack Obama ran Sandy Hook, for example, to promote gun control. The daughter of Andy Rooney, who has a greater Boston radio show, yeah. featured the mayor, the then mayor of Boston, about a month before Sandy Hook, yeah. and he was boasting about his close ties, his friendship with Joe Biden, yeah. and how Joe Biden had told him that gun control would be a done deal by January of 2013. Well, yeah. she was dumbfounded. She said, what could possibly happen that could cause legislation to be passed so fast? 
She, of course, had no idea. Yeah. But after the staged event, and it was indeed a FEMA drill, no. we have the manual for the FEMA event, a mass casualty exercise involving children, which I made Appendix A in the book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, uh -huh. which when Amazon banned it, I released for free as a PDF. Uh -huh. So anyone in your audience, Harold, can download it for free by just putting the title Nobody Died at Sandy Hook into their browser. Yeah. They'll have the first edition right there on their desktop. Uh -huh. we, we, he signed uh, no less than 23 executive orders to constrain our access to weapons under the Second Amendment on the 16th of January, just a month and two days after the staged events of Sandy Hook. Uh -huh, yeah. Now, why would it be that that's the, the, the ratio of that kind of thing would be on that political contingent rather than the other? Well, it's somehow just the way these things have evolved, uh, because believe me, it's the Democrats who've been behind these events at Parkland. It was Debbie Wasserman Schultz. You'll remember she sabotaged Bernie Sanders' campaign. And by the way, it was that which led Seth Rich, who was the IT guy for the DNC, to download all the files that wound up being published by Julian Assange with the assistance of Kim.com, mm. who's a well-known internet figure and expert. Yeah. Uh, well, Debbie was worried that the Democrats might lose as many as 11 seats in Florida alone because she had a, a trial coming up involving Im Imran Awan, who was a Pakistani IT guy she allowed to spy on other members of the House when she was there at the time. So she orchestrated with a woman by the name of Dina Katz, who produces Dancing with the Stars, to have this elaborate march in Washington, D.C., March for Our Lives, which took place on the 24th of March. But that was uh, supposed to be predicated on the events at Parkland. But they, you couldn't have arranged it in that short period of time, about six weeks. In fact, that's not enough time to get a bake sale at a local church. What they did, uh, Harold, yeah. was they began the permit process six months in advance, back in October and September. They orchestrated the event at Parkland. We even had, uh, They sent most of the kids home at 1 p.m. because it was a holiday. So instead of having 3,500 kids there, you only had about 3,000 who played the role of crisis actors. We have a video that Live Leak released, 52 seconds, where you can hear the girls doing their best to scream as though they were in fear, but they're worried about their bottled water, working on their iPod. A kid is pulling his pots in the, on the ground. You can see there's what's supposed to be a body. But it's a training dummy. It's all black with no arms and no head. Yeah. And while there are persons in police uniforms rushing in and out, you think, wow, Parkland was really on, Johnny on the spot getting there so promptly. They're actors in police uniform because Parkland gave up its police force in 2004. How do you get this Niagara of information? It was like it's coming like Iguazu and Niagara combined in the flow that you just put out in terms of that. Why do you think the, 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 the overwhelming uh, example that you cite is on one side rather than the other, as it were, as you seem to be saying? Well, I, I, Obama, Obama initiated the whole process, and there were several of these stunts during his administration, including, for example, the Boston Marathon bombing, where they used uh, amputee actors, Harold. They're, they're trying innovative techniques. There's no question it had Hollywood directing contributions. We had the police on bullhorns calling out, this is a drill, this is a drill. We had the Boston Globe tweeting that a demonstration bomb would be set off during the marathon for the benefit of bomb squad activities. And then these puff bombs went off, and I say that as a former artillery officer in the Marine Corps. These explosives weren't powerful enough to kill anybody unless perhaps you were sitting right on top of them. When you peered through the smoke, yes, there were bodies missing arms and legs, but there was no blood, Harold. Now, as... Uh, uh, it's but impossible why? to have arms and legs blown off yeah. by explosives and there to be no blood, which means this was staged. And in fact, the blood only showed up later. And it came out of little orange duffel bags, which are fake blood kits, or about a half a dozen strewn in the area after they cleared away. I but understand. no one would think of the use of amputee actors, which is exactly what took place in Boston. 
I have a book about it, very, very substantial, where uh, we even went through the trial. And I, ha I have dozens of collaborators on each of these events, Harold. None of this is anything I just do on my own. I, I sift and winnow through the evidence to sort out what's right, what's wrong, what's well-founded, what isn't well-founded. Thus, anyone can take a look, for example, if they go to my blog right yeah. now at jamesbetzer.org, James. they'll see my new blog on the Sandy Hook Posner versus Fetzer lawsuit for dummies where I explain what's going on. Yeah. Well, they're, what they're doing, Harold, is insisting that my denial of the authenticity of this death certificate is a defamation that was intended to embarrass and humiliate the, the father, Lenny Posner, because the state has a facially valid death certificate the state has certified. But we have so much proof that the original, the one he sent to Kelly Watt, is a fabrication, that if the state has a certified, that is, according to their own allegation, the same in every re material respect, that means the state has certified a fabrication. Uh -huh. So we have the direct evidence that the state is involved here, and we have all the indirect evidence that it was a, a staged event anyway where nobody died, which means, of course, of necessity that any death certificate for a Sandy Hook victim is itself a fabrication. What historical uh, reading of the human condition and everything do you, is there, you think, if you read it? We go back through the whole, we're here a couple thousand, hundred thousand years and so forth. What is there about the human condition that seems to have people of a certain mindset are more interested in developing uh, almost like if you if you're a Hollywood producer or a director, you got to make something that doesn't necessarily reflect the Boy Scout truth of the thing, but you do something that's going to get attention and eyeballs into the theater, and there's a certain mindset for people that want to use propaganda what? or particular fake news, and why is it that it is of people, in your assumption or your assertion, that it's a certain political class that would take that over, let's say, if we divide it into a political uh, right and left, that it would be people of a certain uh, uh, persuasion that would be the users of fake news more than the other. Why? Well, what is there about it, the nature? It, it, it's the interests that are being advanced by these moves. It's like after 9-11, what happened? The U.S. got embroiled in the Middle East, taking out the modern Arab states that had served as a counterbalance to Israel's domination of the entire region. Right. It, it hasn't played out that way because of the intervention of Iran and Russia in Syria. And now Trump has made the right move by declaring he wants to get us out of Syria. The deep state is seeking to counter it. John Bolton, who's a neocon's neocon, has gone there to try to get Turkey to commit to not attacking the Kurds, which the Turks will never do because they regard the Kurds as a terrorist group seeking to overthrow the government of Turkey. So now Turkey is demanding that the United States remove all 16 of its bases from Syria and take away weapons it has given to the Kurds. This is quite blowback, very significant, yeah. because the United States really had no business being in the Middle East in the first place. Yeah. 9-11 was brought to us compliments of the CIA, the neocons in the Department of Defense and the Mossad Herald. Yeah. It was to promote the interests of Israel, not those of the United States. Yeah, well, okay. Again, the question is, <clears throat> what <clears throat> what's your projection for, let's say, uh, the next uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years about the fate of the planet in terms of the uh, overwhelming capability to make change in the world, both in terms of the political context and the economic context that is inherent in the time in which we're uh, uh, talking now and experiencing. Uh, are, well, you it, it, are you optimistic, pessimistic for the human prospect, or what do you think? On the, the situation we're in is profoundly troubling. Mm -hmm. The mass invasion of immigrants into Europe yeah. appears to be part of a master plan to use Muslims to destroy Christian culture in Europe. Yeah. 
What we're experiencing on our southern border was organized, Harold. No. I have videos where you can see large flatbed trucks that are driving the immigrants at high speed toward the U.S. border. You cannot set out on a march of 2,888 miles with a lunch in a paper bag. One of the most famous photographs is this rather portly woman. She's got quite a gut for having traveled all that way with children in diapers. Now, if you're going to travel 2,888 miles, how many diapers would it take? I would say probably around 1,000 yeah. at the rate they're proceeding on foot. This whole I thing was staged. Probably. George Soros appears to be involved in it. And Harold, yeah. the trucks that were busing the immigrants forward have on their side the Star of David. Mm -hmm. Again, I ask you, sir, what do you think is the projection into the future of the, uh, are you, I, I ask you again, uh, <clears throat> let me ask you something else. We finally evolved to where we have weapon systems. There's realpolitik, uh, uh, legitimacy in a realpolitik sense comes out of whoever's got the biggest gun can set themselves up and as an authority figure for the operation of human society within a natural order and so forth. And the capability to influence that has grown mightily, increasingly, to the point where apparently, I wonder what you think, uh, rumors of the destructiveness of the collective military capability of the human species in terms of the human society, the human uh, species has grown to the point where they are at a point where they are literally, if they were to be unleashed in a spasm of all-out war, are apparently able to be have modeling that would say it could well mean the end of our species. Do you think? Well, that's, here, let me you, say. Do you think let that's me say. In, I no, spent no, a year no, in New no, York no, as a no, graduate no. student at Columbia, 1968-69. I have a great fondness for New York City. I also have been strongly supportive of Democrats in the past. I voted twice for Bill Clinton. I voted twice for Barack Obama. Yeah. But I could not bring myself to vote for Hillary Clinton, who has been an extreme hawk. She precipitated the slaughter of Libya, which may have been the most humane society ever realized on the face of Earth. Thank you. Other that, atrocities. Yeah. What I'm coming to is this. The Russia hoax was uh, intended to take Trump out from the beginning because he's a threat to the deep state. They so while it. many in your audience may disagree with me, I am convinced that yeah. what he is doing is in the best interests of the American people. There's an ongoing effort here to destroy both our First and Second Amendment rights. The social media giants have been suppressing conservative speech and conspiracy research in the absence of which you frankly have no idea what's really going on, mm. which is why what we're doing in publishing these books as a conspiracy catalog at moonrockbooks.com is so important mm. if you want to know what really happened. We have to maintain our rights under the Second Amendment because if they take our guns, we're helpless. As, as Dave Hodges of the Common Sense Show has observed, during the 20th century, there were 19 genocides each of which was preceded by gun confiscation. We don't want the United States to become number 20. But the question I ask you is an abstract one. Are the weapons that do exist on hair trigger alert, including the, uh, the tridents, the you know, tridents in the American Naval Fleet and others, that the, there are modelings that say that if there was to be an unleashing in a spasm of irrational hatred, uh, they'd be unleashed. It could mean the end of the Homo sapiens species that's been here 200,000 yes. years. Do you think yeah. that's an actuality that's worthy of taking into consideration? Of course. This is and why I believe. That is the truth. This is why the most important film ever made was Dr. Strangelove. Thank Everyone you. ought to be required to watch it at least once a year. Let be, me say this, Harold. The Russians the don't want war, but they're prepared to fight it. Their weapons are far superior. They have the best anti-ship missiles in the world. They have the best anti-missile missiles in the world. 
They have the best weapons overall because they aren't compromised by the profit margin that leads the American military industrial complex to produce inferior weapons that require constant maintenance and upgrading to inflate the amount of money they make at, off of the American taxpayer. We would not benefit from a war with Russia. It would not have a happy ending. We'd lose 100 million Americans. Far better that we keep the 100 million armed Americans we have to keep America safe. It's our greatest source of national security, as was exhibited when Emperor Hirohito declined to invade the United States because his highest ranking military advisors explained there'd be a sniper behind every bush. Those who want to take our guns don't understand they're our primary source of security at a both personal and family level, at a community or social level, but also at a national level. Gun control laws don't work. In fact, if you download the book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook, you'll find the final appendix is by John Lott, who's a leading expert in the area, who explains how when guns are banned, crime goes up. Is that in fact, it's true internationally that there's an inverse correlation between gun ownership and crimes committed because they bring about greater security. They don't create free fire zones. In the UK, as an illustration, when they ban guns, since they banned guns, they've had an epidemic of knife attacks. I, now they ban knives, and I said, what's next? Potato peelers? Yes, they ban potato peelers, and now they're having an influx of a black market in guns. Better to get, away, get rid of the gun control laws and allow concealed carry, and everything will return to a normal relationship. It sounds crazy, but the evidence is there. It's objective results of scientific research. And if you want an illustration, download the book and read the appendix by John Locke. Yeah, John Locke, the John Locke, right? Is that the John Locke? No, but you, done, you didn't address yourself to the question I asked, which is fair enough. Do you think the weapons collectively are species lethal? Oh, of course. Uh, when oh, did of it course. Occur? When did it occur? Harold, 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 we confront multiple threats uh, to the extinction of the species. I'm still concerned that, that Fukushima is continuing to contaminate the Pacific. And once the oceans are gone, the oceans were the origin of life. All uh, species higher up on the evolutionary chain are destined for extinction. So nuclear weapons on the one hand, even nuclear energy, and, and calamities like Fukushima are major threats to the species. And of course, an all out nuclear war, I think would be catastrophic no, to cat mankind without cat any doubt. Well, that's one thing. It was catastrophic to the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a certain sense and limited things and limited question of the historically inherited institutions and situation. But the question is, you do think that there is the danger is that there could be the elimination of the species. There's no doubt about it. That's only and once again, I sense. say this is why everyone ought to watch Dr. Strangelove once a year to be reminded of the horrors that await if we enter into a, a, a global thermonuclear war, Harold. It's the greatest menace facing mankind. No, I, I ask you as a philosophical thing whether that's the case, because that's something after 200,000 years, 10,000 generations, there's something new, as Bobby Dylan used to say, blowing in the wind. That is an ontologic reality. And on the other side, in terms of logic or thinking, there is a capability for us to, let's just say we're running out of time in this program, but there's a capability for humanity after a long struggle. Daedalus had, uh, or James Joyce had Daedalus say, history is a nightmare from which we're attempting to awaken. Do you think we're equally significant existential moment where we do not have to suffer the situation of scarcity for so many of the people of the Homo sapien species and we could transcend scarcity as an ontological reality by which our design capabilities to liberate the entire Homo sapien species within an ecological order and accord with our coming into a new relationship in universe at the same time that we have the ability to destroy it, a unique ontologic situation for the evolutionary process on this planet. Well, it's gonna require family planning 
it's going to require constraints on the number of children each family has that ought to be voluntary. I don't believe in forced sterilization, for example, Harold, and I certainly don't believe in the depopulation programs that we hear about that sound so horrific. But we have to find a way of managing the Earth's population in relation to our ecosystem to find a sustainable balance. Yes. It's most certainly not the extreme view of the Georgia Guidestone that would reduce the world's population of 500 million. But it may be that we're bucking the upper limit to what the Earth can sustain. It's all a question of quality of life, ecological resources, and the, the number of, of, of occupants of Earth that you want to survive and, and thrive. Well, <clears throat> well, that may be. Were you ever in accord or in touch with Buckminster Fuller? Or no, I was you, not. You were not, okay. He, he thought it was possible through good design to do ever more with less, that is ephemeralization. We're able to do more and more with less so that more and more of the world population realistically could be seen in a design sense as capable of achieving a life which would be called the life of a comfortable have. We don't have to have have-nots in terms of what we had to do out of history, and that would be the adverse side of the capability for ending the species, would be the liberation of it and a major ontological transformation evolutionarily, as has been the case with the development of the universe, uh, as another issue that's characteristic of our times. That's all I was trying to say. Well, that's quite a lot to say, Earl. Yeah, yeah, well, I do hope we're able to return on another occasion and deal with these issues at greater length because I find I, it I, wonderful I? and fascinating to join with you in the in these conversations. Well, okay, I do. That's good. We were cut short. It's so shameful. We we got cut short on this because of technical difficulties. We got to do. We got to keep meeting like this, Jim. Yeah. We got to yeah. keep meeting yeah. like this. Okay. And Agreed. We'll be doing that. And uh, it's so good to talk to you. It's so good to uh, be in in touch with you and everything like that. And um, uh, it is. Uh, these are these are the worst and the best of times. And I think we ought to maybe keep that in mind in terms of personal and political responsibility in the time in which we live. It's an incredibly significant moment in which we were born into, I think. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes, I absolutely do, Harold. I absolutely do. Okay. And it, no, it's just such a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Yeah. And I r r regret we can't speak longer today at greater length and in more time. detail. We should have more time. We've got to have more time. we got to have more program. Let's make you got sure, it. Make sure we get in touch. Listen, you've got an important appointment to keep at the hour. We want yes. you to keep your appointment, Jim Fetzer. I want you to get Thank out there you, Harold. and try to do a little talk about the situation of the human condition. Okay, you, you got promise, it, my friend. Will you promise me to try and do that later today? Yeah, Absolutely. Have, have a good, serious conversation about important issues about what the real truth of the situation ontologically is. Absolutely. Okay, we, we'll, we'll do that. So good to see you. Sorry we weren't able to spend it out longer. It's so good to uh, talk my to you. And by all means, let's be in touch and try to set up a thing where we can keep doing this on a more regular basis. If you that would mind. be my great pleasure, Harold. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the audience to have the perceptions, the very distinct and, and uh, uh, perceptions of Jim Fetzer himself. He's a major figure in terms of bringing forth the, uh, the more uh, elaborate reality than is normally the case. Jim, so good to talk to you. Now get to that meeting you have. You've got a meeting. I shall, I shall, Harold, and I can't thank you enough for featuring.